Minutes of the January meeting be approved. I'll second that. Move to second. To accept the minutes. Uh, December. Kate? All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. That's January 12th, though. Oh, the 12th. Okay. My apologies. Where am I at here? Okay, in the 12th. We have no comment sheets. New business finalized. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Commissioner Henderson. I'm sorry, Commissioner Pratt. At the last meeting talked about uh, devising some kind of a letter that we would send out to the families that were going to be affected by uh, not offering a day camp this upcoming summer. So Teresa's put a little letter together that we're going to be sending out. We want you to take the, uh, this opportunity to peruse it and see if there's anything you'd like to to comment on or change. The idea is that um, we're giving them a list of the programs and services that would be available in lieu of day camp. And um, it goes not only through the uh, younger age kids, but also on the back, it talks about teen programs at, at Maldonado Center. So um, to have some idea of what's coming up. So if you want to peruse that and then um, you know give us your comments, um, are we going to have Barbara speak now? Yes. Okay, so let me turn it over to Teresa and then she'll uh, introduce Barbara Wiley. Barbara Wiley is here today. Jason Davey is ill, and I'm not sure if it was planned by design. But anyway, uh, the staff has been working very, very diligently to put together a plethora of programs for the summer. And um, this is the earliest since I've been at the department that we've had everything finalized. So I'm very pleased at their work and the diversity of what they have to offer. Of course, the caveat is we need to do what we can with the money that we have. We're looking at grant opportunities with the Santa Barbara Foundation, with the Workforce Investment Act group, and uh, we're going to try to... Um, leverage our money to the best of our abilities. So without further ado, Barbara Wiley is going to give you some information about our summer programs. Good evening, Commissioners. I understand you're trying to read a letter at the same time that I'm talking. So what you have before you are some of the highlights of what I wanted to touch on as well. Um, and just as a short um, recap, our Remix team, when we call our Remix, the RE is Recreation and Enrichment. Our Remix team consists of three full-time staff and two part-time staff in our leadership um, of the Remix team. So that's who's been working to pull these activities together and our plans for summer as we've redeveloped our summer programs. So the way we've approached things is to make sure that we have something for every age group in the children's area. So we start with our three to five year old age group and in that bracket we have some new um, offerings. We have some a mini chef program for children learning to make food um, items. They're making snack items and it's a parent child um, class together. We do have a games and sports program for children in that age group for the three to five year olds and a new summer playtime that's a recreation program that uh, will introduce them to coming to the programs on a regular basis, some crafts, music, games, and things like that, and some outdoor recreational activities for that younger group. <clears throat> then in our six to 12 year old age bracket, that's our traditional um, day camp um, age group that we've been serving. So we've tried to get very creative with some other new programs that could help fill uh, the need for parents who have been traditionally sending their children to day camp. So we've got our um, safe and strong programs, which are our recreational programs that are drop-in basis at the parks. We're looking to expand those to up to 10 or 11 different parks. I know you've heard a little bit of information on that, and we're looking for the adequate funding to make sure that we can staff those. Those park programs are proposed to be from 11 to 2 every day simultaneously. Uh, so that's a lot of different programs happening at the very same time, whereas before we had two day camps running at the same time. Yes? I'm sorry, sorry was that the drop? That was called Safe and Strong All Summer Long. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a drop-in um, recreational program at the parks. Yeah. 
And then those um, sites are being finalized because we want to make each of those sites one of our summer nutrition sites for the children to get free lunches as well. Uh, we're in partnership with the Summer Food Program with Food Bank of Santa Barbara County and with the Community Action Commission. So we work closely with them and we have uh, proposed 11 sites currently that are being considered for the expansion of the food program. So that gives, that's for any age child. Any, any child under 18 can go and have the free lunch. So they could drop in there and we would be making sure that that's widely known. Uh, not only would we be advertising that and marketing those programs for the recreation angle, but also to make sure that everyone knows that those free lunches are available to the children. We're also part of a countywide uh, collaborative that's working to promote the program and they have a, a, a really high-tech texting program where if you text in the number, uh, the, three local, the three closest food sites will come up on your phone. So any parent could, wherever they are throughout the county, could text that number, even if they're away for the day, if they're down in Solving for the day, if they're in Santa Barbara for the day, they can text in that, text that number and it'll show them the three closest lunch programs where they could drop in and get a free meal for their children. So we're really excited about that um, expansion and that all those lunches are served at no cost to the city. So that's all, we don't pay anything for the lunches, the children don't pay anything for the lunches, and it's all through the USDA and the two food vendors that we work with. So again, in that six to 12 year old age group, we also have a new youth choir. We've been trying to really promote the fine arts. And we have a new drama camp where the children will be spending five weeks getting ready for a production of Disney's Aladdin Jr. So that'll be a fun musical, very colorful, and every child in the camp gets a part in the show. It's not, uh, they're, they'll audition for different roles, but everybody gets in, so they'll have a really fun time doing that. That's also brand new this summer. Maybe. The four weeks of rehearsals will be at the vets, and we're having the final dress rehearsals, and the performances will be at the youth center. <clears throat> now this is much like the, uh, I can't remember the lady's name, the brand that choir. We did have a youth drama program years ago, yes. Carolyn? Really, the first really, name was Carolyn Smith. Yes, that was really neat. Mm -hmm. And now Nancy we have, um, We're very happy to be able to collaborate with Jean Byrne, and she's been running the drama programs for the Orchid School District for a number of years. And so um, we're really fortunate to be able to work with her, and she'll bring with her a large number of children who traditionally seek her out for different shows. She, does, she hasn't been doing a summer program with that, with, uh, locally, she's been she teaches at Hancock during the summer, so this will be a summer production, and it, it, I'm sure it'll draw a lot of children for that. So that'll be a total of a five-week program. It's only half a day, but it'll give the children the lunch, and then half a day at drama camp, and then be everybody will be in the show in, at the end of the five weeks. We'll be sure to get you invitations and get those dates out to you too, so you can catch one of the shows. Also for that age group, we have a wacky science camp and then a new girls rock, rock, girls rock math camp. Since it's um, proven that girls do better if they learn from female uh, math instructors, so there's a special math program coming that's a girls math camp just for them. And then um, to partner with that, the science camp is just for the boys this year as a pilot project. I'll bet they find boys learn better than the female teachers. I, <laughs> I didn't get that a copy of that study, it could be. So those are pilot programs and those are coming to us with um, the teaching staff coming from uh, the Children's House Montessori School. So it's not our staff needing to teach it. We're partnering with the Montessori teachers to be able to offer the academic portion for both the science and the math. Um, okay, then in the teen age group, um, we've got several new things that are coming, um, either coming back or being, um, are, are brand new. And one of the things we're doing is we really want to get more art happening in the art room at the Youth Center. So we have some new art programs in the works, and I'm meeting next week with a team of local artists who are interested in partnering with us and looking to see who might be able to step forward and be um, our paid people there at, this, at the center to be able to teach some art experiences on an ongoing basis. They're also uh, looking to who could support our, our a la carte program, which is our mobile arts education program, which will also be going out to those park programs so that while they're at the park for their lunch and their safe and strong program, it will be visited on a rotating basis by our play trailer and our mobile arts education program. They'll be going out to the parks. Also for the teen group, we have our teen fitness programs, for some just for girls, some for 
uh, bodybuilding and learning how to use the weight room and the equipment. We have a teen trails program, which is a hiking club, and a teen treks excursion program, which takes them to different uh, locations throughout the Central Coast. Uh, also new this, this rec ride for our summer rec ride that we'll be doing um, three times a year is we're just offering a basic open house at the youth center so that parents and youth mentors and pastors can bring youth groups down and see um, what's, what we offer and look at opportunities to work with us at the center. So that for the summer guide, it will be May 19th. And they'll be in the evening and, and anybody who's interested in youth programs or mentors or youth pastors, anybody could come down and visit the youth center and see what we could offer. Other collaborative endeavors this summer are, are um, we're doing a Las Flores Ranch experience where we're having teens go out and work at Las Flores Ranch as a as an educational and a job skills program where they'll be working out at the camp and then they'll have an overnight camp out there as well and Campfire of the Central Coast is helping us with that so they can offer the camping expertise. Um, also with that um, those some of those students that successfully finish our local um, environmental education program at Las Flores Ranch then will be eligible to participate in a program called Nature Corps, where they'll be camping at Sequoia National Park and volunteering for a week. We sent a pilot project there last year with seven different with seven teenagers. It was a huge success, and now this year we're going to work on having our local teens that volunteer in our local park get to go also to volunteer at the state park. So it looks good on their resume, and then for many of them, it'll be their first time out of Santa Maria or doing something of that kind in the camping environment. Um, I mentioned that we're working closely with Food Bank and Community Action Commission for the food program. They're a vital link for us because, of course, we're not in the catering business, so they do the lunches, but we just provide the site. So it's a really easy and um, wise partnership with them. Those are some of the highlights, and then if you have questions about the letter in front of you, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Of, yes, of all of the items that you have listed under Youth Programs and Teen, how many of them are actually new? Um, most of what you see there are new programs, and anything that you, um, anything in the um, the youth choir, the drama camp, science camp, math camp, career camp is being reintroduced um, after a hiatus of about eight years. We're reintroducing career camp for teens, so that's coming back. The Las Flores Ranch experience is new, and um, the summer playtime for the younger children is new as well. Just my opinion, is there, is there any way that all the new stuff can some, somehow be marked as new? You know, because I, I still focus on that first sentence. We've canceled the day program, and if, if there was somehow these are the new things that are going to be replacing that day, that it, it puts more of a, you know, focal point on this is new and... Uh, as, we, as we do the marketing in the recreation guide, we have a... A special notation that we put in the recreation guide when a program's new, so that's what Good. I envis am envisioning. That when they turn to the children's section where it used to say day camp, that there'd be all these list of other new options. We're also working closely with the timing. So okay, that, that, that's good, but even with this letter, because this letter is the one that's going out to the families, that, and yes. if, if, if we can refocus them on the new as opposed to canceled, <laughs> right. that would be nice. Will they get the, the uh, newsletter with this letter? They'll get the letter first because we're just now starting to go into production for the recreation guide, and that will not be available till April 6th. So they'll get the letter well in advance so they can, you know, start to plan and think about dates and things like that. Or slow down their anger. And, and make, um, mm -hmm. make alternative plans if they need to. This letter is just for the families that regularly used the day camp, correct? Right. Okay. I and think then, they went back, was it two years, three years? Um, oh, good. The last three two years. years. Two last two years. years. Okay. And then um, you mentioned on the back the teen programs. So those are all um, free except for the bottom one, the teen treks. Yes. Am I correct? And um, the Las Flores Ranch experience, that sounds like, for me, if I were a teenager, mm -hmm. the most exciting. We're, sounds, looking, for but it's not on we're here. looking for volunteers. So if you want to be one, somebody would bring volunteer the kids. to take care of them. Bring them with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's not mentioned on here. Is there a reason? That the um, ranch experience isn't part of it? It's, it's a very small group of people that I we see. could take. Okay. And so we, I they're believe be they're, they're hand picked. Yeah. Right. Oh, I see. Okay. It'll be kind of like on a referral basis for a small group. Okay. Now, whereas Career Camp, we will be taking um, applications from throughout the community for Career Camp, but they will be um, screened and um, kind of interviewed and, 
so that we can get about 25 teens to go to career camp with the hope that 20 will finish because right. sometimes it's, it's a work camp. They go for 40 hours of work and sometimes they don't want to come back after the first couple of hours. So right. we're thinking we'd over enroll maybe about 25, 27 teens and hope that tw a good solid 20 would finish. And they do get a paycheck at the end if they can persevere and, and uh, do everything they're supposed to do that week. What's the hourly rate? Well, they get paid, um, it's a 40 hour work week. And what we do is we let them know that we're investing half of the time for them. So they're paid for 20 hours a week at, t at minimum wage, which is $10 an hour. But they have to invest the other 20 hours in their own future so that we're having a shared buy-in. So they, they work 40 hours, but they're kind of investing that 20 hours on their own and working the other 20 hours for a paycheck. So you can think of it that they get $5 an hour all week, or you can think of it that it's $10 an hour and they'll end up with that $200 paycheck. And then again, on the front part, the safe and strong all, all summer long, you said 10 to 11 parks. Yes. Um, is there a criteria for picking those parks or is it kind of what fits the... Um, Both. There's a um, strict criteria from the state of California, so every site must get approval at the state level. Okay. Um, and then what we look at locally is the demographics for the uh, neighborhood around that local school. Our parks are so close to the schools that we look at the demographics from that school. And Food Bank has been sharing all their data with us. So we're looking at that, but also um, they look at how much, how far a family would have to travel if they lived in a certain part of the community and they had to walk to get that meal. How uh, far in each direction would they have to walk to the closest uh, lunch site? So that's another factor that they consider. Another element of the Safe and Strong program is something called the Community Walking Bus. And it's as simple as it sounds. If you're a parent and you're home at a certain time and you can walk your child to the parks that we'll be in, then we encourage them to work with other parents to do the same thing. So for those parents that would like to have adult, an adult comp accompany them to the park. We're going to work through our All-America City Committee in its repurposing to see if we can get faith-based people that maybe aren't working during the daytime to sign up as volunteers, do their background checks, and see if we can provide some safety um, or reassurances that an adult will possibly walk some of the kids to the programs. Good deal. Good deal. That's what I was going to ask. What about crossing guards? The crossing guards, and I was thinking even for the, the, the drama and stuff, is really good that for some students that's a long ways away and parents can't get them there. And if they work out something to get them there, because you don't want that seven year old going out and getting at the bus stop and taking them right over to wherever it is. But that's uh, pretty. You know, something else has it, just crossed into my brain in some manner. <clears throat> this gang stuff. Those kids are being recruited someplace. I don't know where it is or what it is. And I'm wondering about the value of the police department maybe meeting with the summer staff, volunteers, and tell them warning signs when they see strangers in the area, that type of thing. To call the police immediately. You don't think about it. Call them. And uh, only because they're being recruited someplace. And then all of a sudden they're in a gang and they're getting young ones. Because the ones so far, well not all of them, but some of them that are getting shot are 25, 29 years old. So obviously they've been around the block a while. But uh, anyway, that's just a thought. I, I, I don't know where it is. I watch everybody now. Anytime I see people talking mm -hmm. to people, I look to see what kind of people are talking to kind of people. Right. And, uh, Last month, we asked the Santa Maria Police Department to come to the youth center. And how many of our staff are there? About 30? About 30 attended this time. And those are most of that staff are working in the after school safety and education program. So they did a program for us on how to identify a gang member, what the signs mean, uh, what do you do if, if a gang member is in your territory and he or she is um, a sees a controversial gang that is not getting along with their gang, they are required to act. That's part of the culture. So we've already done that training. Alex has arranged for a second training that's going to be with parks and recreation, the whole department, 
and um, give us some more tips also. Uh, at that same training, we had an active shooter training for just, we do typically do something like that to, to address any type of safety issue that can occur. So the staff has been um, trained on that. And then once we recruit for the summer, uh, rec leaders will do more training. And um, one of our best trainers is Barbara. So very good. They learn CPR and many things. Those would be good community trainings. Just to exactly. To tell everybody, not just the rec and park staff, yep. here's what you should look for and here's you know, call us. We had something like that a few years ago. I remember attending some sort of community thing at the Maldonado Center, and um, mm -hmm. I learned a whole lot yeah. about yeah, There was a series that Hancock College put on a couple of years back also right. uh, that was pretty well attended. Mm -hmm. The video that they use for um, active shooter is actually developed by L.A. County and Homeland Security. It's really, it's, it's fairly graphic, but it is very good, very realistic. It's, you know, professionally done. So you get all the feels of what things are like uh, during yeah. one of those incidents. So yeah, it's going to take a community effort, not just oh, the not department. Kidding. Yeah. So it's <laughs> yeah. well, the parents also, you know, somebody's talking to their kids sometime, and they got to have their nose and you know sniff in the air what's going on. So yeah. okay, the letter looks great. I, it, yeah. the, the workshops and the programs that are offered sound really exciting. There's um, a few people that I'll be sharing this with. Mm -hmm. that I know of that could really benefit from um, these activities. So thank you. And Laura, if you have any contacts in the school district, teachers that are off for the summer, mm -hmm. that probably may not want to hang out with the kids as a result. <laughs> uh, we're looking for volunteers just to, I, I love the idea of the community walking bus because that, right. that provides a grassroots level of supervision to get them to and from the parks. There are quite a few people um, that work with the schools that aren't yet teachers, um, like migrant mini core um, tutors that are working to be involved with the youth but um, aren't quite yet, and they need to earn volunteer hours and things like that. So I'll share that with the people that I know and, and have them contact Barbara. Sure. Yes, okay. please. Thank you. And and one more thing, it's. We know that we do our best work when we're collaborating with the community. So we have formed a. Um, partnership with Santa Maria Valley Fighting Back and they have agreed to give us eight people that are experts at dealing with the higher at-risk youth which will provide another safety precaution. So they're going to do that at no charge. We're working on a memorandum of understanding as they have done every summer they'll come back to the youth center and do our summer reading program so that for those students that are struggling with reading they have a chance to catch up at the youth center during the summer and we're also um, in discussions and have permission to use the PEG studio that stands for um, public education government to perhaps do a radio podcast about how to lead a productive life for children that may be exposed to certain things. And also, they will be doing some recorded videos with safety messages. So we're looking forward to that also. The other thing you've probably already looked in, this is impressive. I'm always impressed with what you folks come up with. But the uh, public schools just have closed libraries all summer. And if the, if the school district could come up financially with a little bit of help, put somebody in there <clears throat> and have neighborhood use so it's not everybody having to get to the middle of town. Uh, it might get more children into the um, library program. And I know that that's kind of a hard thing, but uh, if we all believe in We don't want those people to going to the library, Henry. Pardon me? That would be, that would be the library board. <laughs> <laughs> now, and, you know, Mary uh, Hoss, Hoss, Hossel, Library director uh, started an after school uh, tutoring program. She's doing a lot of outreach to young people too, trying to open the doors here. But you're right, there is that always that inability to get out. And you know that she's talked to me about trying to rekindle the uh, bookmobile program and try to get the books out onto the street. We talked about a book trailer, if you couldn't get a bookmobile. Uh, that may be one of the elements that maybe we can even talk to her about supplying some books out. Um, if you look around, I believe at the Natural History Museum, they have the book Nook, and it's basically an outside little display box that they put a book in, and you can take that book and basically check it out and bring it back and put it back when you're done with it. 
Uh, those are some other ideas that we've seen in other communities where they've got books into people's hands. So, you know, that's another option to work with the library. Well, I don't know who even talked to the San Ray Benito School District, but somebody ought to be alive in that area. I mean, if we're advocating the education of children, that would certainly be a um, show of belief. That sounds like a Mark Muller to me, who is um, superintendent of children's uh, services. It's, it's a really good title. I want to make sure I get it right. Who's that Mark? He is the one that started along mm -hmm. with Karen Dominguez and his staff he the healthy food, food pan the pantry. Food, yeah, he did a lot with the food stuff. Too. And and we'll be promoting it during the school year, as the staff is always there. Well, I know the problem. Nobody can touch my library, but you know it's a shame to let that just sit there for ten weeks doing nothing. So, thank you, Barbara. thank you very much. Thank, thank you, thank Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks, Barbara. Old business information reports. Thank you, Commissioner Grannon. Um, we have provided you with the. Um, the noteworthy activities for the month of January, and they're in your staff packet there somewhere. Teresa's also provided a budget update on page five. Um, basically, we're about 1.4% under budget at this at the end of uh, December. So about right for the year. Uh, you know, we're at full staffing now, so we don't expect us to be looking at, you know, we're used to be four to five percent under budget, you know, regularly. Now that we actually have people on board, we're going to be looking at probably being closer to that one to two percent, which is uh, fine with me. That's about where we should be. Um, I had a question about the on the budget. So with the repurposing of the All America City Committee. Are those funds affected in any way? Or are they just kind of shifted? Well, like we can talk a little bit about that then, because that was, was going to be one of the things we we're going to talk about All-America City. So at the council's last meeting, what they did is they, they took the, um, the appointment status away from the committee. And what they did basically is they relegated that responsibility to the commission to look after that committee. So they're no longer a Brown Act committee. So they can meet less formally and you know they don't have to have all the, the rules and regulations in there um, however um, they will be making their reports to you and if necessary through you to the city council uh, david rodriguez uh, our outreach coordinator will continue to work with them as the staff person we're going to be looking at uh, they've actually already met and come up with some ideas on how they would like to work and some of the things they would like to work on uh, so I'm, it it is a um, three people that are left. Three yes. people that are left right now, basically are new people. So they are pretty much enthusiastic about seeing a change and making a change and coming up with some actual deliverables that they can do. And then the the goal is to take those three people and uh, multiply them two or three people deep, so they can have committee work and they can find volunteers and they can get things done in the community. And anybody who wants to step up and be involved, then they would go through um, through that committee, work with David, become oriented as volunteers, and then you know be able to help, and then focus on their projects. And the the council's direction was that they were to focus on the Spirit of Santa Maria Award as one area, and the neighbors helping and neighbors, neighbors helping program. neighbors, which is their neighborhood uh, visitations where they would go out and invite neighbors in. For a coffee and donuts or something, um, we probably have to have something healthier now added to that. But basically, <laughs> they'd have a, a, a discussion group uh, in neighborhoods at the park or school or whatever it is, put some banners up and say, hey, come and talk to us about you know your any issues you have with the city or questions or concerns. So they're going to continue those two efforts. And then um, they'll develop a, a working process. Right now, they have a, a um, uh, guidelines for operations as a as a elected as an appointed body so we'll have to modify those a little bit very similar to the commissioner packet that you got when, when you started little kind of the, the, the rules to be a commissioner 
So we'll revise that and, and notch it down from being a Brown Act committee down to just a volunteer group. Now, the lines of communication, and, and who's will be the overseer of this um, group? Um, David Rodriguez is the staff person assigned to it. Okay. So Teresa is his supervisor and his, I mean, sorry, Teresa is his d division chief and uh, Cindy? Cindy. Cindy Hoskins is actually who he reports so to. So we are not involved in the chain of communication. Uh, you will be at the receiving end of anything they want to do. Well, see, that's what I was wondering, though, but that'll be kind of filtered so we don't have a list presented to say. Right, oh. right. <clears throat> You'll get regular reports of their meetings just as the council gets them now from when they have their regular meetings. And with anything that you work on action-wise uh, or that they report to will be passed through you, through you to the council in the form of your minutes. So if they gave your report and it's included in your minutes, it'll go in the minutes to the council. So they do have still its direct link to the council. It'll just have to have a stop here first on its way up. Because the meetings within the community are going to create a list. No well, question. what they do with those is if you meet with, uh, as they meet with the groups in the community and there's an issue, each department has assigned a staff person that handles the issues gotcha. coming from the All-America okay. City Committee. So we never, not that we never see those, but we right. send them directly to person X at Public Works. Mm -hmm. And that person is responsible, assigned by their department head to deal with the concerns that come up from those meetings. I think it's a great so, idea. I just could see them. Yeah. So, no. so when you say they're regular reporting, it's just as needed or would there be a like a quarterly or how, how often would they be reporting? Uh, it would be the minutes of their meetings. And okay. right now they're talking about meeting every other month, I think was the, we, we were suggesting quarterly, uh, but it looks like they want to meet a little bit more often. Okay. So uh, anytime they meet as a body, um, David would take the notes from that meeting and get them to us. City Council had given direction to our director that um, we would have a form and function document. And so what David has done, and it's in my inbox as of today, and uh, we needed one to review it before we shared it with you. He has um, connected the form and function document with the ideas that they have so we can kind of see what the changes are. And you'll see that at your next meeting. Okay. Any questions? So to answer your question, we they kept we kept the ten thousand dollars. That's still allocated to them, uh, and it'll still be used for their events uh, and activities that they want to plan for. Uh, let's see here. Um, I have a couple of items I wanted to hand out to you. We never got to this. Uh, So uh, this little article is written by uh, uh, Dr. Ron Martinelli. Dr. Martinelli is our training consultant for the City Ranger program. Uh, Dr. Martinelli is a PhD doctor, retired uh, law enforcement guy, uh, expert witness, you know, does uh, uh, officer-involved shootings across the country, and is a consultant for a lot of agencies. What he did is he wrote this article, and it, this is kind of a, an article that, that if you get a chance to read it, it talks about people with what they're calling psychomedic, psychomedical emergencies. And these are the people that our officers are dealing with virtually every day. Uh, they, they're, some of them are homeless, some of them are not homeless, some of them are just unmedicated uh, mental health individuals that are out there. And um, over the, probably the last couple of months, maybe since summertime, the instances where the officers have come upon something that is pretty docile, you know, on the surface, and then it erupts into, you know, some violent situation where the officers have to, you know, go hands on with the people, um, get involved that way. And so um, I want to just give you a little taste of what they kind of go through. And, and the article is very good because it, it not only talks about the situation and describes it, it also gives options for, for agencies to use. Uh, when Dr. Martinelli does our training, we talk about this, and we also talk about, um, um, uh, he refers it in here as the, uh, where, where an individual uh, 
because they're so excited and they have these mental issues that they actually become overheated, cause cardiovascular issues with them, and you could have an in-custody uh, medical emergency because, not because the individual has anything the matter with them other than the situation has made them excited. Excited delirium is the reference that he makes in there. But um, just want to let you know that uh, it's a very tough job the Rangers have out there. And they are typically the first people uh, on the scene of, uh, at least in our public places. Um, and police responses could be anywhere as much as 10 minutes away, depending on what the situation is. We do ask the officers to try to make it very clear to them when they're uh, going into a situation that they've assessed the situation clearly. They have everything in mind. They have an exit plan. You know, everything is kind of set in their mind. But, you know, it only takes a couple of seconds for something to go south on them. We had an incident that I have here where we ended up dealing with a, an adult, probably in his late 30s, skateboarding through the parking garage or the mall. It's a violation of the Muni Code. We made contact with a fella and uh, basically he just went berserk with him, uh, picked up his skateboard, you know, had some threatening motions. They ended up having to take him to the ground. Uh, he ended up with a pretty bad gash on his head when he when he tried to take off on his skateboard and actually he fell off of it and he hit his head on the ground. It wasn't anything that we did with him, but it was uh, it was a situation that, uh, again, you're just gonna give somebody a ticket for riding a skateboard, you know, in, in the garage. And they just escalate so quickly and it turned out the gentleman had felony warrants and so he was, we did have the police come out and take him into custody there. Got another situation at the transit center on Monday where the officers were flagged down by a bus driver and the transit center is one of our patrol areas where there was a, a two gentlemen uh, in a fist fight on the bus. They got off the bus, they were in the transit center. When the Rangers got there, they were pretty much calm, but the driver said, hey, you know, these guys are fighting on the bus. So they approached the group and, you know, again, it's just one of those situations where they just went off <laughs> because it's the only way to describe it. So uh, prior to getting there, the Rangers had already asked for the PD to start on their way, so they were there also. But we ended up having uh, one of the gentlemen was taken into custody because he had a, um, oh, let's see here. He had a, a, a felony no bail warrant uh, from the Department of Corrections and he was an active parolee. So basically when you have a felony no bail warrant, warrant usually means they want you back pretty bad. Uh, the other gentleman, uh, I'm sorry, and then this, this gentleman also, they have little flags that pop up uh, when you run somebody on, on the mobile data terminals that flags pop up and this officer safety flag popped up that he is known uh, to be armed and dangerous. Um, we don't have the mobile data terminals, so we don't know that until we actually uh, get the information from a dispatcher or something along those lines and by that time you've already made contact with them you already you know have their id or their names or whatever the second male was found to be on probation for making terrorist threats so you know these are the kinds of people that we're finding you know in our public places and i don't want to characterize everybody like that because i think the parks have the majority are good people out there just to enjoy themselves but we do have these situations where uh, the people that the, team, that the Rangers typically deal with are individuals like this. Um, and the topic of arming the Rangers has come up several times uh, from police department uh, representatives and from the Rangers themselves. Uh, you know, when we started out the program, you know, we were looking at an unarmed program and trying to make it more <coughs> educational and um, helpful, you know, uh, and we still do that. But uh, given the way that things are in the community, it's it's a little tougher for us to uh, to gain the respect, I guess, of the community. There, there's, there's hardly any respect as there is now for law enforcement uh, when they're making contacts. Uh, if you go to a thing called um, cop block, it's a, a uh, what do they call this, a blog? And if you Google that, they'll take you to, uh, to a, a, a site. And on that site, 
you'll find uh, the Rangers as being prominent, uh, prominently portrayed in that section there. A lot of videotaping of individuals who are um, taping um, the incidents on their phones and then posting them to the blog and how unfair the Ranger program is and how they single out the homeless and, you know, um, it's... Our Rangers? Yes, our Rangers, yes. Yeah, we're, we're, they're, they're very popular. <laughs> Uh, and you know, and I think there's there's some um, there's some credence to the fact that that the Rangers deal a lot with the homeless, and but that's not necessarily because they're singling them out. It's that their their mission, their role in life, is to patrol the parks and public places, and those are typically where the homeless are, uh, and typically uh, it's the homeless individuals that we have uh, um, known uh, criminal activity in the past with them. Uh, we know who they are. The Rangers have a, a database of the individuals and, and uh, what kind of contacts they've made with them. And, you know, then we, we also do the background through PD if we get, uh, you know, to find out if they have any wants or warrants. And, and typically, most of the people we contact have um, a warrant of some sort. With the new state laws, you, I think I mentioned this before, you, we are only in a point where we cite out a warrant person. So it used to be they would be arrested, taken into custody, taken to jail. Well, that doesn't happen now. If their warrant is under, I believe it's $10,000, anything under that is uh, citable. So we just write them a ticket and say, go to court, see the judge, and they'll deal with you there. Um, some people have five or six warrants uh, for various issues, and we just keep writing paper. And especially if they're an individual who doesn't have an address, it's harder to track them and uh, find them and do anything with them. And most do not appear to court. They don't go, so it goes to warrant again. And now instead of having six warrants, you have seven warrants. But they're all under the amount, and you know, it's all, they're all just citable. So it's a real challenge for them out there. Um, and like I said, I think the bigger issue comes down to the... the um, I think this in the gentleman at the mall, his comment was basically told him to, to F off and, you know, hey, you're not the police and you can't keep me here. And that's kind of the attitude that they get. Um, so it almost, have, well, I'm trying to go ahead. Well, I have a lot. I have a lot of questions and, and um, just clarification. I, I, this part that you have in our packet on um, having a substation at the transit center, I think it's a fantastic idea. Is that something that there's somebody always there or it's just a space that they can use if needed or kind of a... It, it's a space that they can use if uh -huh. needed and we do use it. Um, we added two new positions this year called security officer aides. So security aides, which are basically security officers, it's a step down. They're not peace officers like the rangers are. Uh, their job is basically to observe and report. They are the ones who have the responsibility for foot patrol of the library, the transit center, and the mall. And they just started just just before Christmas or just after Christmas, I believe. And so they've been uh, stepping up and doing a lot of that. So we have a presence there that we didn't have before. I think that's great. I drive by there every day and um, some afternoons, especially when the weather gets warmer. Um, it, it doesn't look like... Um, um, a hospitable place to be yes. sometimes. So I also had a question since that's under our purview a little bit um, about cameras and surveillance, if those are something that are there, if they can be, if it can maybe um, alleviate mm -hmm. some of those issues. We do have, uh, the, the, the city has a system out that the police chief, I think there's eight cameras that the police department has placed around the city. They're getting ready to place, I think, six more. We have uh, one at Buena Vista, one at Tunnel, and one at Rice. I think it's Rice. Um, and uh, those are tied in They're the same system the police have, so they can go right back to dispatch their wireless uh, cameras. There's four cameras on a pod, and then those are remote control. We can control them from an iPhone, and you can kind of do whatever you need to do with them. Uh, I know that the chief has indicated to us that he's used those in solving some of the issues that are going on around town, that they've provided a lot of information. And when you drive into a section of town, and the most notably right here at the mall, as you're driving under the bridge, you'll see a sign that says this is a blue light zone. Okay. And then there's a camera over by Boot Barn. 
And that pretty much gives you a complete view of Broadway east to the mall, to Bank of America, to the park. Uh, you can control those cameras and they're awfully good, high definition cameras. But we don't have anything at the transit center. Right? Uh, transit center has its own camera system that uh, they put in when they built the transit center. Unfortunately, right. like the one at the library, they don't always work very well. Right, that seems a logical next step. And then I was also wondering, I've got two other, um, the possibility of our rangers having those mobile data terminals, if that's something that they can get, it seems like a really useful tool. The We've put in for new computers for them uh, and the new laptops that they would actually take with them in their vehicles. And we're hoping, well, the goal is that those would be dual use. They'd be able to be used for your, 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 your PC needs and then would also be able to be used as a mobile data terminal and they could log into dispatch. Um, apparently, the way that it works is that the city contracts with the county and the county contracts with the state. So every time an officer plugs in something, it costs like $7. So they're very concerned about you know, right. too much use. So what we tentatively have worked out with them is that uh, the supervisor, the two supervisor positions would have the terminals and when they're on duty, they would be the ones running the, the subjects on there. Right now, if we have somebody that has a warrant and uh, they're gonna cite them out, we actually have to have a police car come over so the ranger can use his terminal in order to get all the information and write the citation. So you're tying up two or three people sometimes just to write a, a citation. So we're hoping that that all happens when all the new communication system rolls out, new radios. Um, I understand too that the police department is working on their body cam uh, policies. Um, and once those are settled and there's an opportunity that we may end up doing that with the Rangers too and <clears throat> providing them with a body cam system. Well, I you know, <laughs> following up on, on that question, the um, officers are trained not to do something by themselves. Nothing, now if they have to bring somebody down, that's one thing, but usually you can wait five minutes for another officer to show up. Right. Yeah, we ask that they approach, if they're gonna get into a situation that, that they feel is somewhat dicey or there's maybe two individuals that they have to make contact with is wait for another, either another ranger or for a police unit to come and then they'll go ahead and make the contact then. But again, there's those situations where, you know, you don't really know and it kind of erupts. And uh, we've had a few of those happen around town. And the thing is, is that um, and you get a lot of comments from people well, you know, they should be in the police department or they should be policemen. Well, the problem is, even the way we are now, uh, when something goes down in the police department, everybody goes. I mean, if there's something major and we're the only people out there at times and we're answering their calls sometimes if it's a traffic accident or if it's a, uh, uh, what they call a 911 disconnect where someone's used the 911 system and hung up the phone on a pay phone, we respond to check out to make sure there isn't a situation. And 99% of the time, it's just kids messing around with the phone. We had one over at, uh, at Blosser and Cook Street a few months back where an individual was stabbed and went to the phone and dialed 911 but couldn't speak on the phone. So the rangers were sent there just to check it out because they couldn't hear what was going on and then they found the gentleman there that had been stabbed. So um, the unfortunate pioneer student stabbing over on, uh, on Donovan Road uh, at, right after school, in essentially what's broad daylight. Um, one of our officers actually made the first apprehension of one of the subjects on the levee trail. And it just so happened that we were there. It wasn't like we, you know, had, he had just finished up at Pioneer High School, which were there every afternoon uh, in the public areas there in the streets. He happened to drive down the levee and run across this kid with a bloodstained shirt, ordered him to stop. All he has is his taser. The guy was 15, 20 feet away and our active range is about that. Um, and fortunately he stopped and dropped to the ground and they were able to take him into custody. But you know, that's the kind of stuff that they're out there facing. And it's not a, you know, I, I hate to be an alarmist, but it's a whole different situation. And it's hard enough for us to keep our officers as it is. You know, they don't make police officer pay. Uh, and so we try to give them as many tools and as much training as we can so that they can respond effectively to situations. And they're asked, you know, uh, to do a lot of stuff. 
You know, they're asked to do a lot of stuff that if you did in the normal realm of a of a park ranger, you know, they're outside of that. In the library, transit center, buses, you know. Yeah, I thought most of our rangers were sworn. No. They can't carry a weapon. They can. Oh, they can. They can be armed, yes. State law allows them to be armed. It's up to the legislative body of the agency to decide that, and they have to go through the same post-certification for carrying a weapon. And, you know, a lot of the, the challenge that they face is that, you know, we have, I believe, um, at one point in time, every one of our officers came from an agency where he was armed or she was armed before, and uh, but they can't, they aren't armed here, so. First thing, right. <laughs> That was going to be my comment. It seems like we're getting closer and closer to we're getting beyond the park ranger and getting closer and closer to police officers. And, you know, obviously there's a big gap in salary and benefits between a police officer and a park ranger. But if we're talking about possibly arming the rangers and they're becoming more and more like it sounds like police officers, is that something that might be considered at some point if things are getting that bad out there that, you know, you know I know there aren't enough police officers in this town either, but... <laughs> Well, you know, it's 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 a it's a two-edged sword, you know, because you know, my when we started the program, my position was I wasn't really interested in arming anybody. Right. And that, from a liability perspective and from a training perspective, it's just something else you have to do. A lot of the people that we're hiring now uh, are either coming from an agency where they were armed, as I said, so they've already been carrying a, a weapon, or they're coming out of the out of the academy where they have been trained and they're certified to carry a weapon. But we just don't have that. Uh, so, mixed bag, you know. Uh, we have a gentleman right now with us uh, who was uh, with San Luis Custody. He was here a couple of meetings ago, Rusty Price, and he didn't carry a weapon in, in custody, so he doesn't really feel any different. But when he was on patrol as a deputy in San Luis County, he carried a weapon. So he was, you know, he can, he can but he's, he's fine. He's, he says, I've talked my way out of stuff. And others, you know, they get in a situation where maybe you can't. It's, it, it's something that we're going to talk about uh, over time. I know that I've talked to the city manager's office about it. I have Dennis working on some research right now into agencies that are armed, um, situations that evolve, what that means. So there'll be more to come, you know, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. I don't know whether we'll proceed anywhere with it, but I figured it's a discussion that we should at least have. It's scary. Thank you. And you're right about the liability. They, or reading this thing here, everything's a lawsuit. Oh yes, yes, definitely. And you know, even, even unarmed, yeah, it doesn't matter. I mean, no. we, I mean, when you put your hands on somebody, there's going to be the potential for some liability there. Right. Uh, last thing I have for you is the um, uh, just a quick recap on the VIP dinner was Saturday for Special Olympics, and again, our, went very well. Teresa and her staff, uh, Cindy. Um, um, Wendy Hudson just did an outstanding job. Um, it's a pirate theme. We had, what, 200 and some odd people there, 20-something uh, tables. It was very well attended. Excuse me. Um, we'll see how successful it was on the fundraising side of things, but, uh, you know, that'll help the program, you know, continue. So we're happy with that. No. Uh, only if there's a question. Jim, anything from Parks? Perlman update? <laughs> Buena Vista Park update? Uh, Perlman Park uh, finished a lot of the rubbing and uh, working with California Conservation Corps. They've done a lot of the hard work uh, and our staff has been directing. Uh, we're going to take about a week or so off, uh, get caught up on some other projects, and the CCC has a couple of projects they're going off to. Uh, and as noted in the, um, the uh, uh, yeah, items, some different items is the CCC, normally they charge, it's caught, normally around about $10,000 a week, they send a crew. And with, this is, we're able to get this into the drought uh, program through the governor's office, and there's dollars in there that they pay for that. So there's no cost for their work that you're providing us. Uh, $10,000 a week? Yeah, they send a crew, so you know, you're 10 to 12 people, you know, that's the salary of the eight hour day, 40 hour week for 12 people uh, is roughly what it works out to. So uh, if we were to have them, you know, normally um, they make themselves available to agencies to do 
for projects like that. Uh, but we're fortunate with the, the uh, this was under the out program, so we're they're doing the work at no cost for us uh, there. And uh, Buena Vista beautifiers, uh, we had a meeting yesterday, showed them a little more of an updated plan. A uh, comment was made by Virginia Sue, so it's a good plan, but uh, would like the um, uh, look at the Portland Louvs. Uh, I think, but uh, they seem pretty pleased with the uh, the progress of the plan, a little more detailed and those type of things. So, um, moving on with that. So, so is that now we're just waiting on the results of the grants that have been written? Is that kind of where we're at right now? Yeah. Okay. The last thing we've asked the uh, engineering department will be handling the the engineering components of it, uh, grading, water, sewer, electrical. All the utilities components of it. Baxter Miller, our landscape architect, he will handle the actual uh, design and elements uh, for the site. I do have a plan. If any of you have a chance, I didn't bring it with me. I apologize. It's just a sketch, but it is the plan of what, how it's going to look. Um, probably 90% of, of what we think we'll see there. Um, Virginia Sousa's comment about the restroom is something she's brought up before where there's a a, um, I'm sure if you've traveled in any of the big cities, they have the bathroom that you basically put money in. It opens up the door. You go in, you use it. It closes the door behind you. You do your business. You come out. It closes the door, and then it cleans itself. They're about a hundred and something thousand dollars a piece for one seat, and we're just not in a position to do that. We can put a public restroom in for under that amount with two seats and. You know, just it's a what restroom. Do have, what do you have to pay? You have to pay, yes. No, how much? A dollar, something like that. I'm not so sure. I think you set it to whatever you want it to be. Um, San Francisco on, on the Embarcadero, you'll see them. They have several of them lined up along this side. They're very nice looking, very, um, I, I always say they look like they should. They belong in England, you know, because they're mm -hmm. kind of that greenish tone with gold trim and just something that just not what we need at uh, at a public park anyway she's the homeless they're still not going to use it well and that's one of the issues that we have with the restrooms the way they are you know certainly it's whomever the public is and they need to use a restroom they use them um because otherwise sorry well if not a restroom then what <laughs> yes well, and that's the situations we have at the mall. They're the stairwells. They're the corners of the building. If you're charging somebody, they're going to go wherever they're going to go. It doesn't really matter where. And then we become becomes a hygiene issue, you know, a cleanup issue and disposal issue for the staff. That's it for us. Anything from the commission? No, it says that we're not having a commission meeting in March. Correct. Uh, Commissioner Velasco, uh, we spoke a little bit about the agenda. It's going to be pretty light. So for your April agenda, we'll be bringing back the All-America City Committee form and function document or whatever the revision is for that. We're also waiting for appointments. Uh, you know, uh, Commissioner Pratt was appointed to the Planning Commission, so that left the vacancy here. And the council is going to consider appointments. Actually, I, I, here. I couldn't make the March meeting anyway, so that's good. That's, okay. <laughs> that's right in. And we'll be discussing committees then as well? Yes, we'll, we will have to wait until we have all the commissioners here and the okay. new commissioner appointed, and then we'll go ahead and, and discuss committees. So April Commissioner Scott. Velasco will be back yeah. at the April meeting. Just a quick question though about Oakley. Are we on schedule there? Because it looked like they've got a lot left to do. Um, actually, Oakley, with the exception of hydro seating, I believe that's the major item, and they, should, they were going to try and hydro seed last week. Last week, yeah, so that's it. It's done. Hmm. So if you go out there and, uh, you know, I I went out for the first time. Purposely, I hadn't gone there. There really wasn't anything for me to do anyway. So I went out and I looked, and I just it's just like night and day from what it was before to what it is now. Yeah, I mean, it looks really good. There's a really lot of verticalness to it. Yeah. You know, it's, and uh, obviously the trees and things are still small, but, you know, those will all grow in. They blended in the playground. Uh, very nicely you know remember it was kind of up high out of the way but now it's kind of just part of the rest of the site they they were able to install a basketball court which was not on the original plans uh, they were able to get a half court basketball court in jim is working on the um, restrooms and snack bar units uh, the 
we will not be finished by opening day March 12th for West Side Little League. There's no way the turf will be ready to handle anything. That, that's, I guess, what I was asking. I saw the March 12th, I had one month. Yeah, no. and it's not going to be ready, so we've already notified them that they'll have to make alternative locations, so we're going to work with them and try to find them a place to play uh, their season, do their opening day, and those kinds of things. I think what we're looking at May, June, maybe, uh, so right at the end of the season, they might be able to have their closing day uh, ceremonies at the field. Um, but the more time we give the turf to establish, the better off we'll be. And if we do get any significant rain during the growing period, you know, the way it is out there, we may, it may just wash off the seeds and some of the grass. So we'll end up with ball spots out there. So all that's going to take time. So we're, we're not overly optimistic and we weren't overly optimistic to begin with you know our estimate was see you next season and that would be uh, about the right time has there been any discussion at all with the school district about opening up those gates a little bit better and letting uh, youth leagues use facilities or at least ground no no we haven't really had those discussions anything else anybody has that God bless. Travel safe. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. Travel safe. Thank you. <laughs> I know.